Good morning. Welcome. We are super excited you have joined us this morning. I'm Reverend Brenda Brooks Alexander. I'm one of the associate pastors here. We are glad you are here, whether you're in person or online. We need you to do just a few things for us this morning, if you would. If you're in person, if you would fill out the attendance pads and pass them down to your neighbor, we would appreciate it. If you're online, use the platform that is online. We want to wave at our Cisco family. Welcome, Cisco. Glad you are here and joining us. Uh, in addition to that, on the back of your bulletins or the upcoming events, you can visit fumcfw.org backslash events and find out all the things that are happening in our church. Of course, this is Backpack Sunday. So if you are in our audience and you still have a pack backpack, we invite you to bring your backpack down to the front altar here. And then if you are at home and you have your backpack, just put it in front of the TV and we're going to bless it as well. All right. Here comes some more backpacks. While they're still coming, let's go to God in prayer. God, our teacher, who helps us to understand the world around us, thank you for the privilege of education. You have blessed our communities with teachers who take new skills and concepts and pass them along to new classes of young people. God, who came as a child to show us how to be fully human, to show us how to be children of God. You have given our children minds that grow and develop in unique ways, at unique speeds, and we are astounded by that miracle. We celebrate the beginning of the school year and ask your blessings upon the children, the educators, the families who support them all. We come to worship together, to lift up our young people and all those who care for them and teach them. Open our hearts to what you are saying to us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hear now the music of Peggy Graft. I'm Pastor Jane, and I will lead us today in our call to worship. Will you please rise in body or spirit and join me? Our good works are done with gentleness. Bitterness only leads to anguish. God seeks peace and hope for all God's people. 
But if our hearts are filled with anger, we reject God's mercy. Open our hearts, O Lord, and help us to listen. Open our lives, O Lord, and prepare us to serve. Amen. Before we sing the hymn 103, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, let us take a few moments, greet each other, and pass the peace of Christ. Please remain standing and join me in our affirmation of faith. The Apostles' Creed could be found in the hymnal on page 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Miss Amber, and I'm filling in for Mr. Mark this morning, and I have the pleasure of being in front of these beautiful backpacks, but we're missing something. We're missing the kids that they belong to. So can I invite all the kids up here, please, for a blessings in the backpacks, or blessings of the backpacks. Come on down, please. Hey kids, good morning. So welcome. You may not know me. My name's Pastor Lance. I'm Mr. Mark's big brother. And I am so glad to be a part of this very special time. Now you may not realize this is a tradition that we do in our church on the last Sunday before school starts. For some of you, we've been doing it since you were little bitty kids going to preschool. And one of the things that the church loves to do is to pray for you all of the time. Sometimes we pray for people when they're going through a hard time or a difficult time. And so we'll lift up and pray for them, knowing that we're helping them to go through a time that's really difficult. And really we're praying that they feel God's love and God's presence and God's work in their life. But we can also pray for people at any time. And when we're praying for people to hope that they recognize how much God loves them and how much God is with them and how much God is for them, that is something called a blessing. All right, say that after me. Blessing. Uh, that's a blessing. And we, your whole church family, are going to be blessing today these backpacks. We also did it at 930. We had a whole bunch of backpacks. And what we do is we bless them not only with our words and our prayers, but with these special elements. This is a bowl full of water, just like the water that we used at your baptisms. And this is a yew branch, which is a fancy tree that Miss Elaine goes and finds for me every year and cuts a piece off of because I am such a stickler for tradition. But you, we have this special U branch. We take this water and we bless this water and we bless your backpacks so that every day throughout this whole school year, we know how much Jesus loves you and is with you and is for you. But we're going to do this together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray the words of the blessing and then I'm going to say loving God. And then every kid of every age here in the sanctuary, whether you're up here or out in the congregation, is going to respond by saying, hear our prayers. Let's all try that together, little kids and big kids. Loving God. Amen. All right, kids, I want you to join with me as we're blessing all these backpacks, okay? God, with you, every transition and new start is a reminder of your goodness, for you are always creating fresh and amazing things in us and through us. Though we, that we may be sad about the summer ending, we are grateful for a new school year. Loving God. We pray for our minds that they will expand in wonder and celebration, learning not just from the books studied, but from the people beside us. Loving God. All right, I'm going to start from the outside in so I don't get anybody. We pray for our hands that they will reach out to help and welcome and care for everybody. Loving God. We pray for our mouths that they will only speak words that bring life and connection. Loving God. We pray for our feet. They will move toward those different from us and help others in safe ways. Loving God. We pray for our ears that they will genuinely listen to all voices, especially those that aren't listened to very much. Loving God. We pray a special prayer for parents and grandparents and guardians at the start of a new school year, which we know is always another leap of faith. Wrap them in your reassuring love as they entrust their children and trust in you. Loving God. We also pray for teachers and administrators and staff and librarians and security guards and bus drivers and crosswalk attendants. Bless these faithful servants and every other with courage and confidence, knowing that you are in their classroom with a steady hand on their shoulder. Loving God, hear our prayers. Finally, we pray for health and for wholeness, for fun and for growth, for surprise and amazement for this school year ahead, knowing that you will always hold us all the way through. Loving God hear our prayers. Amen. Kids, your backpacks have been blessed. We have prayed for you. We are so excited for you to have a wonderful school year. Will you all join me with Indicating So by a round of applause. Thanks, Amber.
Hey, friends, anyone that wants to join us upstairs to continue to talk about blessings for the school years, come meet me right over here at the door. Thank you all. Grab your backpacks. And now let us all stand and sing hymn number 398, Jesus Calls Us, verses 1, 4, and 5. Good morning, my name is Maggie Rolf, and I'm going to be reading this morning. Our scripture comes this morning from the book of James, chapter 3, verse 13, through chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and 7, and 8a. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard, updated edition, and I invite you to read along in your own Bible or one of the Pew Bibles in front of you. It is in the New Testament of the Pew Bible on page 230. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and lie about the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For we know there is envy and self ambition. There will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder and you covet something and cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. God speaks to us through the reading of the scripture. Thanks be, to God. thanks be to God. Thank you, Maggie. Before we consider today's scripture reading and today's message, I want to say words of thanksgiving to all the people who are leading us in worship this morning. Thanks to our uh, music ministry team, particularly those who are kind of guests over the course of this summer season. We're so thankful for you. Thanks to everyone who's teaching in youth ministry, children's ministry, adult Sunday school classes this morning. I want to say a special word of appreciation to our volunteers for our friends breakfast. That's our on-campus breakfast on Sunday mornings for people who are experiencing homelessness. We had 70 guests this morning join us for breakfast here at our church. Great number. Join us for worship as well. We're just so thankful for everyone who makes that such a hospitable and warm place. One of the guests went out of their way to just grab my shoulder today and just say, hey, I just want to let you know what a special place this is on Sunday morning because of the spirit that's here. There's a lot of places that are serving, but very few places that feel like this. So I just want to pass along that blessing and thanks to everyone who makes it so possible. I also want to say a special word of gratitude and appreciation for those whose ministry is in school systems as we begin the start of a new school year. Uh, the profession of teaching is 
extremely near and dear to my heart. I've been so blessed by teachers and educators all throughout my life. My mom was a teacher. My grandmother worked in administration for the, the uh, larger Texas school system. My grandfather was a superintendent of schools. His brother was a superintendent of schools. Just so deeply appreciative for the profession and the work and the ministry of teachers and librarians and special ed teachers and aides and administrators. Just God bless you. Thank you so much. I know a number of you in this congregation are active or retired from that profession and you just, I just want to celebrate you. I'm so incredibly thankful for your work. So uh, yeah, perfect time for a round of applause. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. And uh, before we begin today, I, I want to share, I have, was, I remember a story that I was reading not too long ago. I, I just remember this story that came to mind. It's going to be really helpful, I think, when we're talking about how I want you to engage with today's scripture reading. And it's the story of a man, but really it's the story of a man's crimes. Uh, I was reading a story of a man, and he had committed some extremely significant financial crimes. He had lied, he had stolen, he had defrauded people uh, to the tune of an untold amount of money. And he did so um, from some people who had a lot of net worth, and they were able to kind of withstand those losses. But a significant people, number of the people that he defrauded, uh, were people that that was all the money that they had. They were incredibly, incredibly uh, damaged by the actions of this person. And what is so remarkable about this person who was a liar and a thief and a fraud and was caught and tried, found guilty, and will now die in prison, what's so remarkable, one of the many things that's remarkable about that man is that in addition to being a person who lied and stole and defrauded, he also was a very talented, legitimate businessman. And he had a legitimate business that was by any definition, a very successful business. And that business was itself esteemed in the community and was able to provide for him uh, the resources that he would ever need to provide for his family, for their needs, for their safety, for their living in a nice house in a nice community. He was able to provide for the education of his children. He was able to leave a blessing to future generations. He was able to provide for all of their needs, all entirely through his legitimate business in which he was very talented and very fruitful. And yet he chose to steal and to defraud and to lie uh, to the point that it ultimately destroyed his family and cost him his freedom. And I'll never forget that in the point of the story, the people who were made doing the story had a chance to ask him on multiple occasions and prosecutors asked him on multiple occasions and his victims asked him on multiple occasions, why? Why? You had this legitimate business that was legitimately fruitful. Why commit these crimes? Why do these deeds? And his answer consistently to every single one of those people at every turn, to the victims, to the prosecutors, to the journalists, was, I don't know. I don't know. He never got in touch with, why am I doing this? What is the desire? What is the purpose? What am I hoping to gain from this? I don't know. He had unexamined desires. He had unexamined cravings. We can probably use our imagination. We can probably say, well, of course, it's greed. But why? What was he hoping to have? What kind of prestige was he hoping to gain? What kind of recognition? What kind of lifestyle? Why? Because he never examined it himself. Those unexamined cravings, those unexamined desires lost him, his family, the respect that he had gained over the course of his life, his freedom, and he'll die in prison. Why? And the answer was, I don't know. That's just not good enough, to be perfectly frank. And I don't know is an understandable answer sometimes. I mean, I get it. I'm having a lot of conversations in my household right now that look like this. You took crackers upstairs, and you know that's against the rules. Why? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so maybe that works with crackers, right? 
But how many people are going through their lives and their words and their actions are being driven by some motivation or some craving or some need or some desire, some yearning, some wish or some hope that they've never actually gotten in touch with. And the fruit of it is this poison tree that's hurting them, their families, their place of business, their relationships, their communities, and their very souls. Why? That's what we're going to talk about today. And before we do so, I want to bring it back in context of the sermon series that we're in right now called A Faith That Works. It's a study of the book of James. The book of James is a short book in the New Testament. The word that we use for it is an epistle. It means a letter. It's written by a man that we believe to be the biological younger half-brother of Jesus himself, who after Jesus' death and resurrection becomes a member of the Jesus-following movement. He's a pastor of the new Christians who are living in the city of Jerusalem at the time. He has this amazing nickname I shared with you last week called Old Camel Knees. And it's the nickname that's given to him because he spends so so much of his life in prayer, in deep connection with the Spirit of God that's at work not only in him, but through him. And he's sharing these lessons learned, not only in his own life, not only in his work as a pastor with the community, he's sharing them with a world that needs to hear them. Some of the letters that we read in the Bible are to a very specific group of people. The letters to the Corinthians are like this. They're very specific letters to a church, Philippians the same way. This letter is a little bit different. We don't believe it's written to just one specific audience. We believe that it's a general letter, a circular letter is the fancy Bible study way. Your professor will love that when you eventually start taking classes. It's written to be meant for everyone to listen to, to better uh, understand and learn from. And one of the things that is really key to James when we begin to read it and study it is that he makes it very clear that the life of following Jesus is not just about getting knowledge and data into your head. The life of following Christ is not just knowing the correct things about Jesus. It's about letting that transform your heart and life and having so been transformed that the fruits of your transformation begin to bear out in the life that you're living. That's very serious to James. It's incredibly serious that you not only have a faith that is rooted on the things that you believe about Jesus, but that those things that you believe be at work in your life and begin to impact how you work in the world. That's what a faith that works means. But the flip side of that is also the knowledge that these things that you believe about Jesus, the knowledge, the understanding that you have of Christ and his ways and who God is and how it is that God is at work through Jesus via the Holy Spirit in you is that it'll begin to work on you. Your faith isn't just at work in the world. Your faith works on you. That's been guiding us in so much of our reflection over the course of this sermon series. I've been giving out homework assignments at the end of every single sermon just to kind of get you guys in the spirit of school, right? And everyone's agreed. You've absolutely loved the homework and you've done it perfectly every single day. Thank you so much for doing that. I've given you homework assignments, a way to take this from just being a message about Scripture into something that's very deeply applicable, resonant, and relevant to your everyday life. I want you to reflect again on the homework that we had last week. The scripture reading last week, for those of you who have been attending church for a long time in your life, was probably something you've heard before. It's from James chapter 3 as well. And it was about the power of the tongue, how what we say impacts the world around us. How we can just absolutely burn down something that we've spent years trying to build up. If our speech is uncontrolled, if it's uh, unkind, if it's overly sarcastic or ugly, we talked about the power of the tongue. How, if not checked or appropriately rooted in love, it can cause great damage in yourself and in others. And I gave you a homework assignment attached to that scripture reading. And it'd be very easy to imagine, well, the homework assignment probably was go out and only say nice things to everybody all week long, right? That would be a pretty understandable homework assignment for the week following James 3 in a scripture reading that's all about the danger of an unchecked tongue. But that wasn't our homework assignment last week. 
The homework assignment last week was to instead adopt a new practice over the course of your week. I encouraged you, invited you to participate in a new spiritual practice that you may not have ever considered before. It's something called the Jesus Prayer. The Jesus Prayer is a part of a number of the Christian family tree communities for thousands of years. And it's a type of prayer that's not meant to be just said once. It's a type of prayer that's meant to be prayed over and over and over again in a single session. The kind of prayer that moves from your word words into your head, into your heart, the kind of prayer that's an invitation into a way of meditating, a way of calming your mind, a way of stilling your heart, a way of abiding in the presence of Jesus. The Jesus prayer is a simple prayer. You just say this, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You take a breath and then Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the prayer is powerful in its theological statements, but it's even more powerful in how it begins to root you in the understanding of not only the presence, but the healing, forgiving, restoring, and reconciling work of Christ in you today. Not just once, but always. Our life of discipleship is not just believing things about Jesus, but it's spending time with Jesus in order to learn from him how to live and to love like Jesus. And the Jesus prayer for me is one of the most powerful ways in which you can spend time just deeply meditating in the presence of God. So I spent a lot of time praying the Jesus prayer over this week, you know, doing my own homework. And one of the things that I experienced anew that I've also experienced over the course of my life, and I hope you experience when it comes to deep times of prayer and meditation and presence in the love of Christ, is that the more that you pray and the more that you begin to spend time meditating on the work of Christ's love like this, the more that you can begin to feel unhooking from your heart the things that are so frequently the the cause of pain and difficulty in your life and in the lives of others. It begins to unhook from you things like pride and greed and selfishness. It begins to unhook from you the belief that who you are or whether in your worthiness of love is somehow tied to what you've accomplished or what you've done or what you've earned or how you look the more that you begin to spend time with Christ in ways of deeply meditating on his love and on his presence, the more it begins to lift up all the things that are holding you back in a daily basis and begin to instead heal and replace them with his love for you. James is writing a letter to communities all over the world that he can interact with. These are communities of new Christians And not everything is going smoothly. Not everything is going smoothly in the way that they interact with the world, but also not everything is going smoothly in their lives. Not everything is going smoothly in their churches. These are people who, even though they have given over their lives and they do believe in the work of Christ and they have experienced forgiveness and reconciliation and goodness, they are also experiencing real trouble. They're having real fights in their families, in their communities, and even in their churches. They're having real disagreements. It's causing real pain. Some of them are being sued and hauled into court, even though they're receiving this kind of restoration and this kind of hope and this good news that is possible to them through Christ, and they are believing with all that they have. At the very same time, they're experiencing serious pain, serious struggles, serious conflict, and serious loss. And James is speaking to them, and he knows that their issue isn't that they just don't have faith enough. The issue is they haven't begun to let their faith go to work on the deepest things that are inside of them. There's something that happens a lot when I'm doing the work of discipleship and teaching, either on Sunday mornings or in the classes that we have together. And that is helping us understand how to move our faith past just our words and our actions and instead towards the desires that are manifesting themselves in those words and actions. Does that make sense? One of the things that we talk about here all the time, I use the same language over and over again so it can begin to sink in. So forgive me if it feels like you've heard it, but it's on purpose. The language is what's the thing behind the thing? 
that's going on that led you to act that way, that led you to speak that way? What's going on inside of you, underneath the waterline of your own awareness that is manifesting itself in that kind of language and in those kind of actions? In those churches, James said, you guys are fighting over who gets to be in charge, over who's the most respected, and how it is that you're going to spend your resources. Thank God churches don't have any problems like that anymore. <laughs> I'm so glad we left that 1,900 years ago behind us all, right? You people, like all people, are having exceptionally real problems in your relationships, in your marriages, in your relationships with your children, in your business partnerships, in your extended families, and in your communities. And it's manifesting in things like mistrust. It's manifesting in ways like hurtful language. It's manifesting in ways like lies, anger, and fear. The question that he has is, what cravings are going on inside of you that are manifesting themselves in all of that? Is it because you yearn to be seen as powerful? which is why when the community chooses to go some other direction, you get so mad? Is it because you have a craving for respect? Is it if you have a craving for belonging? Is it because you have a craving for security or significance? Is it because you're yearning for something and you're believing that can be found in the respect from others or your prestige in the community or in the balance of your bank account and when you don't get it, you just lose it? What's going on in your heart that is leading you to act this way? Because as long as you are double-minded, he says, which means you want the things of God, but you're focused on the things of this world, well, then this peace is never going to happen. So what do we want for ourselves? What do we crave for ourselves? What do we desire for ourselves ultimately, really, truly? There's an exercise that I want to share with you, and it has to do with parenting. Some of you are parenting right now. Some of you have actively parented in the past, though my understanding is that you don't stop parenting even when they move out. Is that true? That's awful. <laughs> I had no idea that was the case when I signed up for this. Even those of you who aren't parenting, but you can just imagine what it is to be a parent. My question I have for you is, what do you desire for your children as the outcome of your parenting and hopes for their adulthood? What do you desire for your children? What's your hope for your children? What do you crave on their behalf? Have you ever thought about that before? My wife and I were on a journey, and it was a journey that included a lot of educational opportunities, information opportunities, training, and resource opportunities. And it was for people who were on the journey of discerning whether or not God was calling their family to grow via the miracle of adoption, particularly adoption of children who had experienced some time in hard places and were now eligible to be adopted into a family that would love and support them and be there for them forever. And so my wife and I were in a process of discerning if that was the right journey for us. And I'll never forget a presentation that we heard from a man. And it's a man who's a psychiatrist, and he works with kids who've come from hard places. He works with kids who've experienced a lot of tough times in their life. He speaks exclusively and works exclusively with teenagers. And not one of his teenagers spends time with him because their parents thought that it would be good for them. Not one of the teenagers spends time with them because a trusting adult said, hey, you're going through a lot and you would benefit from this kind of a resource in your life. 100% of his clients are his clients because they've been appointed to be his clients by a judge. Which means those young people, those teenagers, those children have already encountered the judicial system. And this is one of many people who's trying to help make sure that their outcome of their life is something that results in them not only never encountering the judicial system again, but goes on to flourishing and happiness. This is the background that he has and the perspective that he was sharing. And he says, as someone who has this work, would you believe that what I hope for these children with whom I work is actually the same hope that I have for every child? 
regardless of if they've ever experienced trauma or difficulty in their childhood, regardless if they've ever spent one day in the care system, regardless if every single day of their life has been spent in a loving and stable home, an extended family, or if their life has experienced abuse or neglect or trauma, regardless, I have the exact same desire for them and for their future. It was fascinating. I never heard anyone say this before. He said, this is my desire for your kids. He said, my desire for your kids is to, for them to be emotionally healthy enough that they can maintain stable relationships in their adulthood. He said, that's it. All the education, all of the classes, any degrees, any professional certifications, anything else, it's all just gravy. And he went on because he's a psychiatrist, he's a doctor, so he had lots of data and information. But one of the things that resourced in was something that we know to be true, and that is happiness more than anything else in life is determined by the quality of your relationships. It really is. Even more than health, even more than bank accounts, even more than professional success, or anything else. Your key to happiness for most people is the strength of your relationships. And that can't happen if you're not emotionally mature enough to maintain them. But at the same time, if maybe what you desired for your kids was for them to have some sense of professional success and accomplishment, well, that can't happen if you can't healthily maintain relationships. You can't proceed in a career if every single one of them is burning down because you can't maintain a relationship. And of course, so many people would hope that their child might have a family they love of their own someday. That can't happen if you can't maintain relationships. And even things like financial flourishing and stability, at the end of the day, those come down to maintaining healthy relationships as well. And as someone who has a number of children that are very different, I have the same goal for each and every one of them given to me that day by that person. My goal is for them to be emotionally healthy enough to maintain life-giving and stable relationships in their adulthood. Everything else is just a blessing. Plus, I hope they call me during halftime of the Cowboys games like I call my dad. Come on. <laughs> but there's something else too because I'm a pastor because I know who Christ is and what Christ does for us. And that is, I hope that my children, who are emotionally healthy enough to maintain stable relationships in their adulthood, I hope that they know that when they're yearning for a feeling of accomplishment, when they're yearning for a feeling of belonging, when they're yearning for security, when they're yearning for significance, for meaning, for value, for purpose, and when all the people around them are getting lost in the cul-de-sacs of career and accomplishment, bank account, or relationship that try to earn or achieve some of those things, my prayer is that they come to realize, to know at the very core of their being, that the solution, the way to achieve, the way to experience every single one of those things, belonging, security, and significance will never be found in anything other than the love of Christ Jesus, their Lord. That's it. That's my desire for them. Full stop. That's what I yearn for them. That's what I hope for them. That's what I pray for them. So if you have a child, young child, an adult child, just a loved one, niece or nephew, if there's young people in your life that you know or love or care for, my question is, what do you yearn for for them? What do you desire for them? And here's the trick. That whole exercise, that whole background work, all of that thinking we just is, just did is my way of tricking you into realizing that that's what you want for yourself too. Because it's so easy for us to, play, to pray blessings and to wish the best things for young and innocent people. And it's harder for us to realize that that's what we want for ourselves. Too. So the question is, and here's your homework, what's the ugliest part of your life right now? What's the most broken relationship that you have? What's the most regular point of hurt or disconnection or fear or pain? What is it that is resulting in more discomfort or disillusionment in you right now than anything else? What words or actions by yourself or by others are hurting you the most? What's that greatest source of pain? And the question is, what's the thing behind the thing? in you or in somebody else. Just like James is pointing out in this text, yes, there's division, yes, there's fights, yes, there's problems. What's the thing behind the thing? What's the craving? What's the desire that's manifesting in all of this ugliness? Because here's the deal. Christ your Lord 
will meet you right where you are today. That man who had more than he would ever need and yet was still lying and thieving and defrauding innocent people over and over and over again at the core of his life needed something and it will never be found in enough of other people's money. And if he had just learned to take that to Christ instead, he could have been healed and delivered and restored and made right by the only one who can ever actually satisfy. It was too late for him. It's not too late for us. Where's the biggest source of pain? What's the biggest source of hurt? What's the craving or the desire that is manifesting itself in our lives in ugliness and in fights and in pain and in disagreement? What are we yearning for that can't be supplied by the world but can only be fulfilled by Christ? And will we let him do it for us today? I want you to imagine that in your spirit. I want you to hold it in front of you in your mind this craving, this desire, this need for recognition, belonging, security, a sense of accomplishment, a sense of respect, a sense of having earned or owned something that will mean you're worthwhile, hold it up to Christ and let him make you whole in him instead. Would you pray with me? Great and loving God, great are you and greatly to be praised. Lord, we trust you that in Christ, you will heal our desires, disordered cravings, things that are guiding us towards ways of pain. Lord, we trust that whatever it is that we are searching for can be ultimately found in you. Lord, we don't want to be double-minded. We don't want to be consumed with the things of this world. We know that leads to nothing. Lord, help us to set our hearts and our sights and our hopes in you today as we know that your love, your kingdom, your way, your world is made possible for us, made known to us, shown to us, and promised to us through your son, Christ Jesus. Through the Holy Spirit, help us to trust and to know. As together we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We invite our ushers to come. We are celebrating 150 years of being a downtown ministry because generation after generation have faithfully supported the ministries of our church. And today we invite you to partner with us as we continue to celebrate 150 years. Would you join us as we continue to sustain these thriving ministries of our church through your gifts and support. Let's pray. Great and loving God, we give you thanks for all those who continue to give faithfully to sustain the ministries here and beyond the walls. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity to partner with our gifts of support. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As we sing hymn number 354, I Surrender All. Verse 1 will be sung by Meredith Ball. Verse 2 will invite the ladies to sing. Verse 3 will be the men. And then verse 5 will be everyone together. And we will all sing the refrain all four times.
some time you've been visiting this church, you've been somewhat part of us, but you would like to deepen your relationship, you would like to deepen your connection, you become a member of this church. In September, we're kicking off a series where you will have a chance to spend time with every one of the pastors. We will have some deep conversations about who we are, what's the ministry like in this church, what the life is like in this church and the faith that makes this church work. We call it Disciples Path, and if you have any questions about it, please come to the on-ramp where Angie will help you register, plan to attend, and give you more information about it. Also, if you have any kind of questions about our ministries, that is your place to be. And if you're a guest with us today, first of all, thank you so much for worshiping with us. Please come to the on-ramp. We have a gift for you and we have a gift for a child. On our uh, congressional care station right here to my right, Marsha is there after the worship service for everyone who would need a word of prayer. Maybe something's going on and sometimes it just helps when somebody is there to pray with you, to pray for you, to continue to carry you in prayers through the week. And that is what Marsha is there for. Thank you. And our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.